Okay, here's a quick pop quiz on geography and touristy stuff. What's the biggest city in Italy? Hmm, did you say Rome? Then you got it right. Rome has a population of over 2 million people. And what would you say is the current population of Venice? Well, that's a tricky one to know by heart. But to answer correctly, in 2022, it was a little over 258,000 people. Now, what if I told you that for 80% of them, the Venice they live in isn't the tourist and historical one with all the canals. It's rather the other side of town. If you know someone who's traveled to Venice before, they may have sent you a postcard with an image of a gondola in a canal. I bet you never imagined that Venice could also just look like this. Just a regular old Italian city. As tourists, we have a strong misconception about what Venice is. We think the real Venice is what we see in the movies. Well, I hate to be the one to pop your illusion, but there's more to Venice than straight canals and old bridges. Here are the boundaries of the real Venice. Probably the postcards you get only picture this bit of the city called Centro Storico, or Historical Center. But the city also includes the mainland, called Terra Firma, where most Venetians live today. The interesting thing to look at is how the number of people living in the historical center has decreased over the years. From then on, the number started to reduce more with each passing year. Today, only 50,000 people can afford to live there. To understand that, let's travel back in time for a moment. Before Venice became an important Italian city, it was nothing but a fisherman's village. It was only around the 5th century that people decided to take a chance and build on the marshy ground of the Venetian islands. If you've ever wondered how Venice holds up, let's just say it's due to strong blocks of wood driven deep into the ground. As it turns out, you need oxygen and water to ruin wood, and in marshy soils, there isn't much oxygen, so the buildings were safe. It was during the Middle Ages that Venice became one of the world's most important maritime empires. You might remember that's where Marco Polo, the famous merchant and explorer, came from. The city was extremely well located, right in the Adriatic Sea, and had access to huge commercial empires of the time, like the city of Constantinople. At that time, the most prestigious jobs you can get were like the ones Marco Polo had, anything related to long-distance trading. Since then, Venice consists of 118 islands, and some say there are around 400 bridges in the city. Quick question here, can you name at least two of the most famous Venetian islands? Let's start with Burano. The island of Burano is famous for its lace-making and its super colorful landscape. FYI, Burano is also home to a less famous leaning tower than the one in Pisa. It's called the Tower of Burano. And then there's the island of Murano. They are famous for their products of fine glass. You can find anything from huge vases to water glasses, jewelry, and so on. They're quite exquisite, but also super expensive. But you know what they say, time changes everything. In the 20th century, Venice was no longer the trading hub it once was. Its economic power was failing seriously. So the city decided to invest in something else, its historical value. And the best way they found how to do that was through preservation. Let's face it, if you're a tourist who enjoys history, you would jump at the opportunity of visiting a UNESCO heritage site, wouldn't you? Initially, this was rather good for the city. But the thing is, as tourism in Venice skyrocketed, the old dynamics of the city started to change to keep up with the intense tourism. Truth is, in our day and age, lots of tourists rather buy small and cheap souvenirs than invest their money in expensive manufactured goods, such as the classic Murano glasses. The traditional Venetian stores that were open hundreds of years ago just didn't have the economic power to compete with new stores that opened to cater specifically for tourists. And then, what happened next is something we often call falling down the rabbit hole. Because, as it turned out, tourists attracted more tourists, and Venice lost control over it. The maximum sustainable number of tourists in Venice would be around 22,500 people per day. But in 2021, Venice saw up to 80,000 tourists per day in certain parts of the year. If you remember that there are only 50,000 people living in Venice's historical center nowadays, that almost means that tourists outnumber locals by 2 to 1. This is what gave Venice one of its current nicknames amongst the locals, which is a short-term city. 
I mean, if you live in a touristy city such as New York City or Paris, you'd be sure to avoid the parts of the city that are more touristy. But in Venice, that's difficult, since we're talking about several small islands. Whether you want it or not, the city is constantly packed. Locals started to complain that things such as getting a table at a restaurant or crossing an important square, such as Piazza San Marco, would take hours. Not to mention that instead of normal car traffic, well, in Venice, you can experience some gondola traffic. But that's not even the worst that's been happening. As the number of tourists per year started to rise exponentially, so did the infrastructure to accommodate all these people. When landlords understood that they could make more money off of tourists than they could with locals, overall prices started to soar. That's why, from the 1950s onward, fewer Venetians were able to continue living in the city's historical center. Landlords decided to more than double the prices of housing. So, a family that paid around 800 euros for their apartment now had to pay something around 1,500 euros to stay in the same place. And social services couldn't even do anything about it, because there were so many similar cases happening all over the historical center. This may sound like something small, but when you stop to look at the big picture, it's changing the social fabric of the city. Yep, that's what usually happens in super touristy places. France is having to deal with a similar problem of over-tourism. France's Ministry of Tourism has concluded that tourists are spending less money, yet over-exploiting the classic tourist landmarks. Cities are made up of much more than just buildings and infrastructure. As urban sociologist Georg Simmel said, cities need to be heterogeneous. And by raising the prices of rent so much, the first ones to be kicked out of the city were the younger generations. After that, only well-established elderly people could afford to stay in the city center. Things started getting so out of hand in Venice's historical center that UNESCO itself threatened to put the city on its list of heritage sites in danger of severe damage. That's tough, huh? The city is still trying to find ways to mitigate the effects of tourism. The first thing they did was to ban those huge cruise ships from stopping in the city's historical area. Oh, and the city produced a tourism fee. Normally, anyone sleeping in the historical center already pays a fee. But nowadays, tourists have to register their entry and pay a daily fee for exploring the main island. The profits from this fee are directed toward making life in Venice's city center more affordable. Hopefully, these policies will allow Venetians to move back to Venice's city center. Ciao! According to the United Nations, India became the most populous country in the world in 2023. Can you guess where the United States of America stands in that rating? It's number three. And America is the fourth largest country in terms of size. It takes up some 6% of Earth's land mass. Plenty of space for 335 million people who live there, right? No need to squeeze them into one region. Well, not quite. The population of the U.S. is distributed pretty unevenly. Let's draw a line right through the middle of the country. It'll run from North Dakota in the north to Texas in the south. Once you input census data and do some math, astounding figures appear. 80% of the U.S. population lives east of the imaginary line. The remaining 20% live to the west. That's just one in five Americans. We're talking about large metropolitan areas, such as Los Angeles, San Diego, and San Francisco. You don't believe me? Just look at a satellite map of the U.S. at night. The right part is shining pretty bright, right? But why? Why is there such a huge imbalance in population? Simply put, history and geography. The East Coast is the place where the U.S. became independent in 1776. These are the original 13 colonies. Soon enough, settlers started spreading westward. One important milestone was the Louisiana Purchase. Today, this region is mostly what we call the Midwest. The area aligns nicely with the Mississippi watershed. Yup, this means plenty of fertile soil ideal for agriculture. But does this automatically mean a spike in population? The demographics of the U.S. reveal that a majority of its citizens live either on the east or the west coast. This leaves a large patch of land in the middle of the country virtually empty. 
People know it as America's underpopulated belt. The area stretches from the Canadian border in the north to Mexico in the south. The total surface area of this strip of land is 350,000 square miles. That's twice the size of California. One massive piece of land. In fact, this narrow strip accounts for 12% of the contiguous United States. That's the U.S. without Alaska and Hawaii. The belt runs north to south through seven states. But its population makes up only 1% of the total number of people living in the United States. Now, this doesn't mean that the area is completely empty. It's still home to just over 3 million people. That's roughly the population of the island country of Jamaica. But there is room here for many more residents. Let's take the example of Nigeria. Its total land area is slightly bigger than the sparsely inhabited belt in America. But Nigeria's population is a huge 206 million people. This makes it the seventh most populated country on the planet. Impressive, right? But why isn't the American Midwest living up to its potential? Well, time for one last history lesson. I've already mentioned how the United States expanded from the East Coast to the West Coast. This doesn't mean that the West was lagging too far behind. Take, for example, the cities of San Francisco and Los Angeles. They were incorporated in 1850. That's just 13 years after Chicago. The following year, Portland, Oregon became incorporated. You get the picture. And then, in 1869, the United States completed building its first transcontinental railroad. In terms of transport, the country was unified. There is no historical reason strong enough to explain why so few people live in the center of the country. So now it's time for some interesting geography. If you look at the physical map of the United States, you'll notice that this belt lies in the Great Plains. As the name suggests, the area is flat, which should be ideal for large settlements. Well, not really. East of this region, there is a huge patch of the color brown. It's covered by mountains. But not just any mountains. These are the Rockies. The range is around 76 million years old. It has several peaks over 14,000 feet. And most of the Rockies are national parks, a vast nature reserve. But most importantly, the range plays a vital role in the region's climate. Ever heard of the rain shadow effect? Let me explain. Wet weather systems form over the Pacific Ocean. Then they travel east, where they meet the Rockies. Now the air has to go up over the mountains. This is where it cools down and condenses. The final result? A lot of rain and snow for the people living on or west of the range. And just a few drops east of it. When air from the Pacific finally reaches the Great Plains, it doesn't contain much moisture anymore. In fact, the weather system starts taking up moisture from the surrounding landscape. This creates an arid climate east of the Rocky Mountains. That's the exact location of the belt where so few Americans live. It's one of the driest parts of the country. So when settlers came in the 19th century, they were like, nah, I'll just continue west. Plus, there was the gold rush in California they were heading for. The climate in this part of the plains isn't great for agriculture, and huge fluctuations in air temperature don't help either. In a single day, temperatures can drop from 70 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit. These sudden changes in outside temperature are harmful to human health. It's like stepping inside an air-conditioned room on a sizzling summer day. Not a pleasant feeling. Southern California has a similarly dry climate. Yet, close to 40 million people live there. This makes California the most populous U.S. state. Their secret? A vast network of irrigation canals and aqueducts, plus a share of water from the Colorado River. Summers in the Great Plains get very hot, while winters are extremely cold. The reason behind these wild weather patterns are polar winds. They get a piggyback ride along the ridges of the Rockies and then rapidly descend into the plains. A winter day in Wyoming, for example, can start pleasantly warm, but later in the afternoon, the temperature can easily drop below zero. You just wouldn't know how to dress, and you probably wouldn't want to relocate here. That's what 99% of Americans think, too. Humans like to feel comfortable, so we choose to live in temperate climate zones. Places that are either too cold or too hot don't have a large population. 
Just look at the driest inhabited continent. You've guessed it correctly, it's Australia. Nearly 70% of the country is either arid or semi-arid. That's a subtle way of saying that it's a desert. That's why Australians are huddled in coastal areas. 90% of them live in big cities, such as Sydney, Melbourne, and Perth. The only exception is the capital, Canberra. They build it inland close to a water source. But Australia's interior is sparsely populated. Just like in the States. There is only one major town in an area the size of 12 Lake Michigans. A huge shout-out to the residents of Alice Springs. They truly live in an oasis. And what about places with a temperate climate, like Europe? The population is evenly distributed here, right? Well, yes and no, depending on the country. In Germany, 77% of people live in urban areas. They have plenty of major cities to choose from. Berlin, Hamburg, Munich, and Kuhn all have over a million residents. But let's look at neighboring France. How many cities with a population over a million can you name? Okay, Paris, definitely. It has over 12 million residents in the metropolitan area. But now comes the staggering fact. The next two cities on the list have a population of barely 2 million, respectively. Can you notice the huge imbalance? This is the case in most large European countries. In Greece, for example, 35% of the population lives in the capital, Athens. So, the largely underpopulated center of the United States is not a unique example. America is the land of opportunities, but chances of finding a better life are greater in large cities. The country's top 100 metropolitan areas account for at least three-quarters of the nation's GDP, and most of them are located on the east and the west coast. There are no cities with over a million residents in America's underpopulated belt. At the beginning of the 20th century, somewhere off the coast of West Africa, a German steamship was leaving the port. Suddenly, the weather got worse, and the vessel entered a thick fog. The sailors ran aground on a sandbank close to the shore. Luckily, no one was hurt, and they were even able to save their precious cargo. But the ship was stuck in the sand for good. And it was not alone there. Nearly the entire length of the western coast of Namibia is called Skeleton Coast. If the name sounds scary, that's because it is. This 976-mile-long beach line is among the most dangerous places on Earth. The local Bushmen tribes believe that their supreme deity made this land when it was angry. The Portuguese were the first Europeans to set foot in Namibia in the 15th century. And yep, they didn't like Skeleton Coast either. Portuguese explorers thought this land presented the gates to the underworld. This is the place where the Namib Desert meets the Atlantic Ocean. It might be dangerous, but it's actually beautiful. Plus, it's a UNESCO World Heritage Site. If Skeleton Coast had a PR manager, they would quit on the first day on the job. The area is not exactly tourist-friendly because of its geography and history. Beneath the sand and the waves, there is a secret ocean currently lurking for unsuspecting sailors. It's called Benguela Current. It flows towards the north along the coast of southern Africa. This part of the Atlantic is rich in marine life, but the current's land neighbor isn't that happy with the deal. This arid climate created the Namib Desert, one of the driest regions on Earth. And that marine life I just mentioned? It's sharks. 11 species of them to be exact. And yes, the great white decides to pop by once in a while. So far, we've got a desert landscape, strong currents, and sharks. Not a place for a beachside resort, definitely. But if someone ends up on Skeleton Coast, will they know they're in danger? Don't worry, they will. The beach is littered with wrecks of all sizes and shapes. If you remember that German ship I mentioned in the very beginning, its massive and rusted stern is now sticking out from the desert sand. There are some 500 wrecks in total scattered along the coast. And it's a mixed crowd, from Portuguese galleons centuries old to ships that ran ashore here in the 21st century. A modern fishing ship called Zela India managed to slip from its tow rope in 2008 and ended up on Skeleton Coast. 
Okay, it didn't escape on its own. It had some help from the elements. But it's better to be a tourist attraction on a beach than to be broken up for scrap. That's where the trawler was originally going, poor thing. Skeleton Coast's most famous inhabitant, to call it such a place, is the wreck of the Dunedin Star. The British cargo liner ran aground here in 1942. The massive rescue operation that followed reveals why it's so dangerous for sailors to end up here. The rescuers managed to save all of the crew and passengers, but at a heavy price. An aircraft and a tugboat were lost in the process. It took the last of the rescuers a full two months to return home to Cape Town. Why, you might wonder? One look at the map of the region reveals the reason. It's an endless sea of yellow, which is the sand. There are so few roads here, so Skeleton Coast is hard to reach by land. There are also legal obstacles. You need a special permit to drive into the area. But the skeletons in the name of the area don't only refer to ships. They also stand for animal bones. Most of these belong to whales and seals. Many animals have adapted to the area, so lions and hyenas roam the coastline in search of a meal. Yeah, now there are hungry lions as well, as if those sharks weren't enough. Other animals with a temporary residence on Skeleton Coast include elephants, cheetahs, leopards, and giraffes. In 1971, the Namibian authorities established a national park here. But except for surfers, after an adrenaline rush, they don't get many visitors. You can understand why. The Namib Desert is the oldest desert in the world, and it's not very tourist-friendly either. Those who travel to the region should pack sunscreen and a warm winter jacket. A weird combo, right? Well, not so much when you think that during the day, temperatures soar over 110 degrees Fahrenheit. At night, the air temperature drops below freezing. What a climate roller coaster! And that's not the final danger. Yep, there's more. Remember how that German ship got lost in thick fog? Yeah, it wasn't a one-off event. Because of the region's climate, fog shows up frequently. Sailors should cover their ears now, but this fog is actually good for wildlife. This is their only source of water in the Namib Desert. Reptiles and mammals have adapted to the harsh climate. They use as little water as possible. Shifting sands, thick fog, strong currents, lions, and sharks. Not the stuff you would put in a tourist booklet, but Skeleton Coast isn't the only beach on Earth you wouldn't want to spend your vacation on. I will take you to Cape Tribulation in Australia. The area covers some 48 square miles in the northwestern part of the continent. And no, the area is not as dry as Skeleton Coast. It's part of the Daintree Rainforest. You could say that here, it is the rainforest, not the desert that meets the ocean. The beach at Cape Tribulation is straight from a postcard. But looks can be deceiving. Hmm, Australia? Probably sharks. No, crocodiles are out here to get you if you decide to go for a dip in the sea. There are saltwater crocodiles that the locals call salties. Well, that's a cute nickname for such a dangerous reptile. And it's not just them. The wildlife seems to have a beef with visitors. From October to June, the waters around Cape Tribulation are full of box jellyfish. Their venom affects the human cardiovascular system. When touched by a jellyfish out at sea, swimmers won't have enough time to reach land for help. Vinegar helps neutralize the sting, so you might want to keep a spare bottle in your luggage. Crocodiles and jellyfish sound dangerous, but there's one more animal you should look after. It's the wild boar. It might sound funny, but you won't laugh when you're being chased by one of these across the beach. 21 million wild boars live in Australia. They're mostly active at night, making it even more dangerous if they charge at you. The best defense is running in circles. Wild boars can't cut corners well. That's probably why we don't see many of them taking up careers as race drivers. Cape Tribulation has one last danger installed for you, and it's not an animal. Out here, even the trees are plotting against visitors. The stinging tree got its name for a reason. If you try to pick one of its beautiful red berries, it'll fight back. Its prickles are like tiny glass shards. The less than pleasant effect on your skin will last for a month. Then there is this wait a while bush. Who keeps naming them like this? 
This long vine has spikes that grab hold and just don't let go. They are so strong, they can pull a human off a horse. You'll have to wait for someone to come by and save you from this thorny grabber. If you are about to cross this Australian beach from the vacation list, hold on for a second. Tourism is booming here. The local authorities have restricted access to all of the danger zones. Visitors go swimming in dreamy water holes that are surrounded by lush vegetation. There are even ropes to swing from. Now that's a beach you can finally relax on. No, you can't see the Great Wall of China from space. It's a cool myth, but it's still a myth and has nothing to do with reality. NASA confirmed it, and now you know it too. Still, the wall is a magnificent place, and you're lucky today. I'm taking you there, so fasten your seatbelts. We're going to China, the biggest Asian country, the third biggest country in the world, and with over 1.3 billion people living there, is still the most populated one, even though India is getting closer and will probably take the first place soon. China is also one of the oldest nations in the world. It has 3,500 years of continuous written history, but the civilization existed long before that. Historians believe that China wasn't populated by settlers that came from somewhere else. The Chinese civilization most likely got formed from local Stone Age people who lived on the territory since the prehistoric period. So no wonder that the country is full of history and ancient landmarks, and I'll show you a couple. We are at the Great Wall. It's over 13,000 miles long, almost five times the distance between New York and Los Angeles, or a bit longer than the distance between North and South Poles. This is impressive, even today. Of course, it didn't take a day to build it. In fact, the wall was being built for centuries. Maybe you know that ancient cities had walls around them to protect the locals from the invaders? Yes, Chinese cities had them too. The first Chinese emperor united the country in 220 BC and got a brilliant but very ambitious idea to turn all city walls into one big wall that would defend the country's borders. So the process started. In the beginning, the wall was made of rammed earth and wood. Every next emperor would pick up the big wall project, strengthening and extending it, repairing, but also modernizing construction techniques. Some used brick to build the wall, some moved on to granite and marble blocks. Watchtowers and platforms weren't there from the beginning as well. They were added 19 centuries after the construction started. So the wall is quite inconsistent in terms of material, but it only adds more charm to the construction and shows how much effort and time it took. You can notice that some bricks have writing carved on them. They were left by the workers who were building the wall. The purpose of those writings is quality assurance they contain such information as location, quantity, and responsible officials. So in case of problems with the quality of materials or constructions, it would be known who was responsible for that. Also, mind that the wall is poisonous. To prevent erosion of the wall by insects, arsenic, a poisonous chemical element, was used in construction. So better not lick it in case you had this weird urge. The construction stopped at the end of the 19th century because the wall lost its strategic and military importance in the world due to technological advances. Walls are way less efficient than they used to be, coming close to zero efficiency. So the construction lasted over 2,000 years, still making it the longest construction project in the world. Unfortunately, today the Great Wall isn't in the best shape. It's estimated that only 8% of the wall is in good condition, and the rest is considerably damaged. Also, around one-third of the wall has disappeared without a trace due to both natural erosion and human damage. Also, many bricks were taken away from it in the last century to use in building farms and homes. The wall is being deconstructed stone by stone even today, but this time by tourists. Quite a few of them take a stone as a souvenir. That's a total of a lot of stones, considering that over 50 million tourists visit the Great Wall every year. So we're not taking a souvenir from our today's trip, just preserving the memories. Let's now pay a visit to the Forbidden City. It's an imperial palace that took 16 years to build and was completed 600 years ago. To this day, it's the largest palace in the world. It has 980 buildings and over 8,000 rooms. Why Forbidden? 
Well, centuries ago, ordinary people like you and me couldn't just walk the streets of that town since it was considered a divine place and was home to the emperor. No one could enter or leave the city without the emperor's permission. Today, the Chinese more often refer to it as former palace, but of course in Chinese. I just can't pronounce that. The designs there aren't random at all. The details reflect the traditional Chinese architecture, and even the colors are chosen with the help of feng shui. The roofs of the city are yellow, which represents the supreme power of the emperor. Most walls and pillars of the city are red, representing fire, earth, and strong support. The floors there are made of so-called gold brick. These are not actual gold, but surprisingly, they are just as valuable. It's very hard to make them, and especially to copy the ancient technique. Two original tiles from the Forbidden City were sold for 800,000 yuan. It's 115,000 US dollars. You can also see animal statues on roofs. Just like colors, animals have meaning in Chinese culture. Dragons, phoenixes, and lions are the most powerful ones. Dragons symbolize strength and good luck and are crucial for the culture. They appear everywhere, in idioms, legends, astrology, art, and so on. In ancient China, emperors were considered sons of dragons. So it seems like the Targaryens aren't the only ones after all. And ordinary people weren't even allowed to have items with dragons. As for a phoenix, in Chinese mythology, their rare appearance during the ascent to the throne of a new emperor is a good sign of harmony. In feng shui, it's also a symbol of luck, and when used correctly, it's believed to bring positive energy to the house. Lions signify strength and power. They always come in pairs, a male and a female, and they're the guards. The number of animal statues on the roof signifies the importance of the building. The city is made of wood, and without any nails used, they are considered violent, so they aren't welcome. You can imagine that a wooden city is a serious fire hazard. A little fire and the city with a 6th century history will quickly turn to ashes. So, fire prevention is taken very seriously there. The city has a whole bunch of firefighting equipment, and there's even a special fire brigade that knows the whole layout of the city better than their own apartment and watches the city every day. Walking around the city, you can notice something very unusual. No birds are sitting on the roofs here, ever. When it was built, the birds were taken into account, and the engineers constructed the roofs in a particular way to ensure that no bird can land and sit on them. The roof spines are wider than the width of birds' claws, and the slope of each roof is higher. Also, the roofs are made of slippery tiles, so the birds can't land there. What do they have against the birds? Well, this way the city stays cleaner and looks more magnificent. So, there are no birds, but there are over 100 cats in the city. They actually are an important part of this story. Some of these kitties are royal descendants. You see, two royal dynasties that lived in the city kept cats. The dynasties later collapsed, but the cats stayed in the city and have lived there ever since. Of course, some stray cats have joined the royalty over the years. But hey, no one minds it, and no DNA test has been made to see who's royal and who's not. After all, they all equally patrol the city, hunt mice, and possibly some stranded birds, and guard the city. So all cats are welcome. Welcome to No a small town located in the south of Seward Peninsula on the west coast of Alaska. If you live here, I'll bet you say there's no place like Nome. Well, maybe not. It's cold and snowy here, and no roads connect this town with other settlements. And with the onset of night, locals have disappeared here without a trace. Perhaps that's why only 3,500 people live here. Well, let's investigate this case. People disappear in cities for assorted reasons. But it was Nome who attracted the attention of the public. From 1960 to 2004, some 24 people went missing there. That number is statistically too big for such a small population. People just didn't come home in the morning, and no one knew what had happened to them. All the locals in small towns like Nome know each other. 
there are almost no strangers here, as it's difficult to get to Nome. There are no roads and no ferry crossing. All roads from Nome break off and lead to beautiful natural landscapes unspoiled by human mammals. You can get there and back by plane. And this is not some passenger jet, but a small biplane. Another way to get there is by snowmobile. By the way, Nome is the ultimate point of the famous dog sled race, the Iditarod. Also, you can pay locals from neighboring villages and towns to bring you to Nome by motorboat. But despite this, the town has become quite famous. The frequent disappearance of people finally got needed attention. The whole world found out about Nome, and in 2009, Hollywood even made a movie about it. For a long time, no one could solve the mystery. The police had no clues, no witnesses, nothing. There are long, cold nights here in winter, and the air becomes so cold that a glass of water freezes in minutes. Snow can fall constantly. Therefore, if someone leaves the town at night, snow will sweep all traces away by the morning. Of course, people began to come up with their own theories. The most popular one was about someone who took people away by force. The police didn't find any evidence that some person could do it. So, if it's not a human, it could be some beast. And again, police found no evidence to support this version. After that, people started thinking that creatures from other planets caused these disappearances. Many locals were sure that the town was a popular destination for extraterrestrial spaceships. The plot of the Hollywood movie The Fourth Kind was based on this version. More time passed. Finally, the police and the FBI launched a large-scale investigation, and they uncovered the truth. They realized that the stories about missing people were exaggerated. The popularity of Gnome and the constant talk about fantastic things made people believe in the reality of these versions. Now, let's assume that some of the appearances were made up. But still, many people are gone. What about them? The answer is bars and harsh weather. Entertainment venues are open at night. Some locals have fun, leave the bar, and go home. At this moment, a heavy snowstorm begins. Visibility drops to zero, and the strong wind knocks you down. This way, a person might simply get lost. And that's it. The truth turned out stranger than most versions. The Bermuda Triangle is a big area in the Atlantic Ocean, so the disappearance of ships and planes there seems not so surprising. But it's much creepier when it happens on a lake. Let's visit the Lake Michigan Triangle. It's located between Michigan and Wisconsin. For a couple of centuries, terrible things have been happening here. People put the same legends around this place as around the Bermuda Triangle. They reported unexplained phenomena and saw flying objects above the lake surface. Some believe that the triangle is a time portal. Of course, no theories have been confirmed, but strange cases have occurred on the triangle territory. One happened in 1950, when a Northwest Airlines plane with 108 passengers disappeared without a trace during a flight over the lake. Police officers saw a red light over the lake two hours after the plane's last communication. The aircraft probably crashed, but rescuers didn't find any passengers or wreckage. All that's left was just an oil stain on the water. Many ships and boats disappeared there. But one of the strangest cases occurred on April 28, 1937. It was midnight. One ship was sailing through this lake. Captain George Donner went to sleep in his cabin after a hard day's work. Three hours later, the vessel was approaching the port. One of the crew members went to the captain's cabin to wake him up. The door was locked from the inside. The assistant knocked, but no one answered. When he suspected that something had happened to the captain, the assistant unlocked the door. He got into the cabin, but there was no captain there. He seemed to have disappeared into thin air. The crew couldn't find him. Since then, the eerie disappearance of Captain George Donner remains unexplained. Meet David Polides. In 2008, he finished his career as a police officer and began to study the mysterious disappearance of people in Europe, the USA, and Canada. He found out that most people went missing in the U.S. national parks. 
Over the past 150 years, more than 1,100 tourists have vanished there. Many of them were experienced travelers who knew how to survive in harsh wild conditions. David has written about these mysterious vanishings. He pointed out that some of them didn't disappear, but were found alive. They woke up somewhere in the forest and didn't remember what had happened to them. The creepy detail of all these cases is that most missing persons were young. Another detail is that many went missing before hurricanes. There are too many riddles and not enough answers in this case. Then there's the Sargasso Sea in the northern part of the Atlantic Ocean. This is the only sea that doesn't have shores on land. It's called the sea only because it's defined by ocean currents. Also, golden brown algae grow in this area's bottom, making it seem like an orange spot in the middle of the endless ocean. The Sargasso Sea became famous because, in the 19th century, one of the most famous phantom ships in history sailed here. In 1872, a brigantine sailed through the Sargasso Sea. Its captain spotted another ship a few miles away. He lit a signal fire, but received no response. Then the captain decided to sail closer to find out what had happened. On the hull of the mysterious ship was the name Mary Celeste. The captain of the brigantine and several crew members went on board. They walked around the deck and looked into the cabins and the hold. Everything was in place, but there were no people. The cargo and barrels remained untouched, so pirates didn't attack the vessel. The only damaged thing on the ship were the sails. They were torn to shreds. All documents except the logbook were missing from the navigator's cabin. The last logbook entry was added on November 24, 1872. The crew of the ship was never found, and this was one of many cases. In the 20th century, from the 60s to the 80s, there were many reports of empty boats and yachts floating on the sea. Also, some entire ships disappeared without a trace. All these cases still remain a mystery. According to one version, the four-sided current forms water funnels. Whirlpools can quickly pull a ship into the depths of the sea. This explains the disappearance of boats. But what about cases when the vessel is still on the water without a crew? Sometimes these whirlpools can create wind vortices. They're like little tornadoes. What if these whirlwinds are powerful enough to throw people overboard and tear the sails? Yeah, the theory seems too fantastic. So, what do you think happened? Here's a riddle. Which U.S. city is so loved that its name should be repeated twice? You guessed it, New York, New York. But the thing is, how much of New York do we really know? I'm talking about the city that lies under the city. Dare to join me on an underground tour of the Big Apple? Then grab a flashlight, it's about to get dark. We'll start in the heart of Manhattan, in the front of the Romanesque City Hall building. Believe it or not, Beneath our feet lies New York's oldest subway station, known as the Old City Hall Station. It opened in 1904 on October 27th, a night of true celebration for New Yorkers. People were so excited, some of them spent the entire night riding the trains back and forth. Before this, urban dwellers moved around in carriages pulled by horses. No wonder the subway was such a hit! You might feel like a time traveler stepping inside the Old City Hall Station. The architecture is dazzling and one of a kind. They sure don't make subway stations like this one anymore. Fun fact, the old City Hall station would cost $6.2 million if it was built today. Back in the day, it had dozens of brass chandeliers hanging around. It was one of the few spots in town with functioning electricity. And oh, not to mention brand new multicolored tiled arches and stained glass ceilings you can still see today. Impressive, huh? If you decide to wander down the tracks, you might be in for a treat. Underground New York is as fascinating as the city above the ground. But one thing we usually take for granted is the behind the scenes of what the Big Apple needs to function. Down here, you might see one or two of New York's pneumatic mail tubes. These tubes were built back in the 1800s and they were operational up until the 1950s. They were responsible for distributing people's mail through different post offices. Letters flew at an impressive speed of 35 miles per hour. That's almost as fast as a professional runner. It sure sounds like a useful system. 
but I have to say, it feels weird imagining people's correspondence flying around 15 feet underground. Back to street level. We'll wander around fancy Lexington and Park Avenues. If you look up, you'll see the famous Waldorf Astoria five-star hotel. Many celebrities have stayed there, including John Lennon and Yoko Ono, as well as presidents such as FDR. This is why the hotel used a secret infrastructure to sneak people inside and out. Under the building, a tunnel known as Track 61 connected the Waldorf Astoria to Grand Central Station. The track was deactivated in the late 70s, but some people say Andy Warhol threw a party there in the 80s. I bet that was something. For the next part of our visit, we'll have to take the subway uptown. We'll get off at 125th Street and find ourselves on the scenic waterfront of Riverside Park. Here, you'll find abandoned tracks of an old metro line. If you follow the tracks, you'll get to an underground graffiti gallery, aka the Freedom Tunnel. The tunnel is named after a graffiti artist from the 80s, who is commonly known as Freedom. While exploring these tunnels, we'll see over 40 graffiti pieces he painted over 15 years. There are spray paints of James Dean, Mona Lisa, and even a self-portrait of Freedom himself. Moving on, let's wander around the northern part of NYC for a bit. Walking in Van Cortlandt Park will feel like hiking upstate, but believe me, you're still in the city. Along the way, you'll encounter some big ventilation towers made of stone. These towers were once part of an old New York infrastructure. They make up the remains of what used to be the Croton Aqueduct. In the 1800s, the city's water supply flowed through a 41-mile-long underground tunnel, all the way from Croton River in upstate New York to Bryant Park in midtown Manhattan. Oh yes, and I should probably tell you that Bryant Park wasn't a park. Instead, it hosted a colossal stone structure that looked pretty much like something ancient Egyptians would build. This four-acre structure served as the city's water reservoir. It even had a pathway on top so that people could enjoy a nice afternoon stroll while looking at the reservoir's crystalline water. Now, all this exploring might have made you hungry, but don't worry, our next stop includes a yummy treat. We'll have to leave Manhattan and make our way to Brooklyn. In case you didn't know, New York City is made of five boroughs, Manhattan, Queens, Bronx, Staten Island, and Brooklyn. Crown Heights, that's our stop. Would you believe me if I told you that beneath these streets lie caves full of aging cheese? How very Parisian of them. To get down there, you'll have to make your way through a century-old building that now works as an office space. Maybe wave hello to all those hard-working people and disappear in one of the stairways that will take you 30 feet below the ground. You won't need a flashlight for this one. The caves are bright and renovated and can hold up to 22,000 pounds of cheese. But hey, it might stink. That's the main reason cheesemakers decided to use underground tunnels to age cheese in the first place. After a bite or two of some delicious cheese, let's keep going. While still in Brooklyn, you might see tons of locals enjoying a sunny day in the McCarran Park Pool. This pool is a huge attraction, being three times the size of an Olympic pool. As the NYC explorer you are becoming, you might even go for a swim. But hey, there's a much more interesting part to this attraction. The pool was built in the early 1900s, but it was shut down in the 50s. During this time, urban explorers discovered a network of underground tunnels right beneath the pool. And, of course, you can find a secret entrance and get a peek for yourself. There, you'll not only see the pool's filtration and heating system, but also a lot of graffiti from the time the site was abandoned. Neat! This question may sound weird, but have you ever seen a cow in New York? I sure haven't. Well, maybe there's a reason for that. Apparently, New York still has underground tunnels that were constructed for the transportation of cattle. Once New York started to flood with automobiles, cows became a burden for traffic until a 200-foot-long cow passage was built below 12th Street to transport the livestock that was ferried over from New Jersey. These days, you won't be able to visit this place in person because the tunnel was most likely destroyed. But historians found blueprints proving its existence. To add to the list, archaeologists discovered a very peculiar fossil a while back. Now, imagine peeling off the layers of the city's soil. 
First, at 15 inches, you'll find a layer of wires. I'm talking TV cables, electricity, and all that. Digging deeper, at 4 feet, you'll see water and sewage pipes. But then, at 15 feet down under the surface of NYC, diggers have found a fossilized shipwreck. The wreck is located right under Broad Street, where there was once shallow water. They believe the wreck dates back to the 1600s. It's 92 feet long and 25 feet wide. Oh, and that's not all. At the intersection of Bowery and Canal Street, engineers stumbled upon a room with its walls and ceiling covered in mirrors. And no one has managed to explain the existence of this bizarre place yet. Our Big Apple underground visit is coming to an end. But we sure did more than just scratch the surface on this one. Before we finish, let's enjoy the best of what NYC cuisine has to offer. A good old bagel. Who knows, maybe next time we'll do Paris or even London. See you soon, Explorer. This hidden village is called Algashima. It's located right in the middle of a volcanic crater. You can find it to the south of Japan, in northernmost Micronesia. The story goes that a volcano erupted in the Philippine Sea in the 1780s, causing a lot of harm to a nearby community. Half of the population managed to escape the massive eruption and came back years later to rebuild their village. At the moment, about 160 people are living there peacefully, even though the volcano is still considered to be active. Huacachina in Peru lies in one of the driest climates in the world. And still, it's a beautiful town, surrounded by lush palm trees. It also has a lagoon, which is said to have special healing properties. The settlement has a little over 90 residents that manage small businesses. Most of them use sand as their primary resource. Some offer sandboarding services or even provide luxury dinners in the desert. For over 500 years, a small group of people has been living on a cliffside of a peak called the Green Mountain. It's one of the most remote places in Oman and in the whole world. The only way to reach the settlement is on foot, by mule, or by all-terrain vehicle. It's called Al Sogara, and you need to hike around 20 minutes up a steep stone staircase to get there. The village appeared back when the locals chiseled their houses into the mountain stone to protect themselves from storms and the cold. Five families of the Al Sharaki tribe still call this place home, about 25 people in total. A lot of other villages like this one can be found in the region, but Al Sogara is special because it's the only one that is still inhabited. Up until 14 years ago, there wasn't even electricity or telephone lines here. The nearest road you could drive on was nine miles away. Since there were no schools, people had to learn how to read and write at home from their elders. To this day, the villagers continue their traditional practice of building their homes by carving them directly into the mountain rock. One of the most beautiful Greek gems is Monimbasia, a castle town located in southeastern Peloponnese. It was designed to be invisible from the mainland for added protection. You can only see it from the sea. And to reach it, you need to follow a narrow pathway that connects it to the mainland. That's actually how its name came into being. It translates to a single passage. Monimbasia was built in the Middle Ages, exclusively carved in the mountain rock. These days, a lot of old mansions have been turned into guest houses and boutique hotels. Not only is the architecture amazing and beautifully preserved, but it's also surrounded by crystal clear waters. A town with no roads? Pack your bags for Gietorn in the Netherlands, if you don't mind traveling by boat. The town is very peaceful, probably because everyone here travels by canals. Even the mail gets delivered by water. Since there's no car traffic and people rarely move around, the town is really quiet. So quiet that the loudest sound one can hear is the quacking of a duck every now and then. It initially started as a movie set, but Hobbiton, in New Zealand, still exists, even after the filming of The Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit was finished. Tours to the charming set town are now available. There are 44 Hobbit holes in total, though only a few of them are actually open to the public. 
The isolated cliffside village of Gasa Dalar in the Faroe Islands has a population of only 11 people. It's mostly known for its scenic waterfall, which falls directly into the Atlantic Ocean. You could only reach it on foot, hiking through the mountains not so long ago. However, a tunnel has been constructed recently, making the place easily accessible by car. The 1980s musical Popeye had a custom set built on Malta. It wasn't taken down after the filming had been finished. And Popeye Village is now home to groups of beautifully colored wooden buildings and a company of actors. There's a lot of fun stuff to do there, like watch theater shows, go on boat rides, visit museums, or simply explore the creative village. The oldest and most photographed village in Austria is called Hallstatt. It's a hidden European gem with beautifully preserved old buildings and a subterranean salt lake. It's also home to a museum with artifacts as old as 7,000 years and the world's oldest salt mine. Fort Bortange in the Netherlands is a small establishment shaped like a star. Creative parts aside, it was built this way for defensive purposes. It gave the guards of the fort a strategic advantage because they had a perfect 360-degree view. These days, the construction is perfectly preserved, including its old buildings, cobblestone streets, wooden windmills, and sophisticated bridges. In Morocco, there's a traditional earthen village made entirely from clay bricks. You can find it in a valley close to the Atlas Mountains, 32 miles from the capital of Morocco. Merchants who followed the Trans-Saharan trade route went through this town, carrying spices and gold. As the trade route became less and less popular, many of these fortresses were abandoned and are now preserved relics. It's one of the best places for skiing in the world, but it's still hidden from the public. No wonder the locals call it the secret side of the valley. Located in Austria, the tiny village of Barth has only a couple hundred inhabitants. Not only is it the snowiest village on Earth, but it also has access to one of the biggest ski slopes in the world. Its popularity increased a bit in 2013, when the construction of a high-speed road was completed nearby. Birano in Italy is one of the most colorful islands in the world. Because of its vibrant colors, it almost looks tropical. It features emerald green waters, beautiful houses, and a 17th century bell tower. Its lace-making tradition brought Leonardo da Vinci to the island back in the 1400s. He bought a piece of cloth there and later used it for the design of the famous Dome of Milan. If you have a UK passport, you must be familiar with the beautiful small town of Bybury, as its scenery is featured in your ID. It's surely one of the most charming towns in Europe, as it's made up of stone buildings standing on the River Colne. The image in the UK passports is that of Arlington Row, a line of weavers' cottages that date back to the 14th century. The town of Cooperpedi in Australia is partially underground. It all began back in 1915, when opal deposits were found in the area. To this day, the town is still the biggest opal mine in the world. People living there figured out that it would be more comfortable for them to stick to the underground as the temperatures outside can reach 125 degrees Fahrenheit. So, the settlement now has underground stores and galleries. Cooperpedi is also home to the world's first four-star underground hotel. To visit the most remote location in the whole world, you'll need to prepare yourself for quite a journey. If you're traveling from the United States, for example, the easiest route is a 15-hour long flight to Cape Town, South Africa, followed by a six-day boat ride. Only after that will you reach Tristan de Cunha. Or you can take a month-long cruise across the South Atlantic Ocean, whatever works better for you. Planning in advance is a must, since there are only nine boat trips to the island yearly. The island itself is just seven miles long. Sitting right in the middle of the South Atlantic Ocean, it covers a mere 37.8 square miles. The 300 residents are all farmers. They have the internet, but it's really slow. As for a phone network or a local newspaper, neither is available. 
the inhabitants of the island speak a dialect of English that is used by the smallest number of people in the world. Discovering hidden places on our planet is extremely exciting. Today, I'm taking you on a trip that you aren't going to forget anytime soon. But suit up, this is about to get very cold. You hop on a plane and land on the ice-covered island of Greenland. An unbelievable view of the Aurora Borealis, aka the Northern Lights, is greeting you. You can't believe your eyes. Your guide tells you how rare this phenomenon is. Usually, people spend days trying to hunt it down. You feel lucky and take your time to appreciate these beautiful dancing greenish lights. You're glad you brought your camera along, aren't you? Between clicks, you learn that the Aurora Borealis is the result of some rather rough events. This spectacular light show occurs when energy particles from the sun slam into Earth's upper atmosphere. On day two, you continue to explore the place by air. This may not come as a surprise, but Greenland is one of the world's largest islands. This time, on board a helicopter, you can see the infinite icy landscape. In case you're curious, you're now flying over 656,000 square miles of thick ice. Oh, what's that down there? It looks like a family of polar bears. You don't want to get too close, of course. The conditions in Greenland might be too tough for people to live there, but some animal species do very well in this land of ice. Those are reindeer, wolves, and arctic foxes. On your way to Greenland, you probably made a pit stop in Copenhagen. Denmark is one of the few countries that have commercial flights to Greenland. You didn't know this before, but you find out that the island is actually part of the Kingdom of Denmark. On a map, it's right between the Arctic and Atlantic Oceans. You're lucky to have a local pilot that tells you about the secrets hidden in this scenery. Under this two-mile-thick white surface, there's an entirely different world. A world filled with canyons, meteor-carved craters, and millennia-old plant fossils. You are beyond excited to go visit one of these spots, but of course, you'll have to use your imagination, as all of it is hidden under ice. Believe it or not, nearly 80% of the island's surface is covered with it. The first stop on your tour is Greenland's Grand Canyon. You land not far from it, somewhere in the northern part of the island. You may know that canyons are deep, narrow valleys with steep sides, but I bet you didn't know that the word canyon actually comes from the Spanish word canyon, which means tube or pipe. Now, this Grand Canyon has some similarities with the one in the US. First of all, in size, it's at least 460 miles long and up to 2,600 feet deep in some places. There's a true subglacial valley down there, and if you're wondering how this happened, well, the canyon had probably been formed by a river that had been flowing through Greenland before the ice took over. Oh yeah, Greenland hasn't always been covered with ice. It was once green, no pun intended. Many other icy places on Earth, such as Antarctica, were once covered in greenery. Scientists have figured out that in the past, Greenland was mostly ice-free. With the help of airborne radar, they made amazing discoveries. By the way, ice is invisible to radar technology. If you have trouble believing it, try putting an ice cube inside your microwave. It won't melt or heat up. A recent discovery of fossilized plants allowed researchers to estimate that Greenland used to be much warmer than they could imagine. 2021 research conducted by the University of Vermont found fossils of twigs and leaves, which left researchers very confused. They expected to discover sand and rocks in the deepest layer of ice, but instead, they found some clear proof of rich flora. Judging by what you've seen of the landscape, it's hard to believe that forests were once growing here. Today, you'll find some tundra vegetation on the coastal part of the island, and that's pretty much it. But according to the genetic material found in these fossilized plants, researchers believe the island used to be much greener it's very likely that there were insect-filled forests with butterflies and beetles flying around. And the average temperature on the island varied from 50 degrees Fahrenheit in the summer to 1 degrees Fahrenheit in the winter. NASA's Operation Ice Bridge has flown over Greenland more than 100 times. This has allowed researchers to create 3D maps of the island and figure out the age of each layer of ice in Greenland's ice sheet. Ice sheets can help answer many scientific questions as they form over the span of thousands of years. They're layers of snow on top of more snow. 
the snow gets compacted into ice, which in turn creates what we call an ice sheet. Remember those fossils we were talking about? They're believed to be from the Eemian period, which was 130,000 to 115,000 years ago. According to the groundbreaking 3D footage from NASA, we can see three distinct climate periods within the ice sheet. The uppermost layer is quite flat and uniform. If you decided to dig deeper, you'd find the layer formed during the last ice age. It's more complex and rugged. The ice there is darker than what you see on the surface. If you let your mind wander, you can picture what this part of the world looked like when mammoths were roaming around. If you kept digging, you'd eventually find leftover ice from the Eemian period I've told you about. Now, canyons aren't the only unusual thing found under ice. If you could sneak a peek under all those layers of snow, you'd see an impressive mountain range and also plunging fjords. In 2017, scientists created a map that showed what Greenland had looked like without all that ice. There was a bowl-like depression in the middle of the enormous island. This depression was most likely an ancient lake. Around it, there was a circle of coastal mountain ranges. This scenery probably resembled the landscapes of modern Patagonia. Big mountains with snowy tops surrounding crystalline lakes. This ancient lake in Greenland is a wonder on its own. Imagine a pit the size of Rhode Island and Delaware put together. The lake is believed to have covered over 2,700 square miles, and back in the day, it was fed by at least 18 different streams. These crystalline blue waters were surely very inviting and freezing, of course. But if you ended up going for a swim, I'd say be careful, as the water could get up to 800 feet deep in some places. On day three of your adventure, you discover a true under ice water park. While you're wandering around the ice covered island, your guide tells you to be mindful of the cracks in the surface. These cracks are responsible for the modern day aqua lounge going on down there. Meltwater and rainwater flow down the cracks in the ice all the way down to the riverbeds. This forms a landscape of jewel-like lakes and streams filled with crystalline water. Researchers estimate that about 60 small under-ice lakes exist there. And yes, they're actual lakes. Perhaps one of the most impressive hidden features on this island is a meteor crater. Under the Hiawatha Glacier, you can find a 19-mile-wide impact crater big enough to swallow the city of Washington. Apparently, a mile-wide iron asteroid struck Earth's atmosphere within the past 100,000 years and chose Greenland as its landing point. If anyone had been around to see it, they'd have witnessed a real show, a white glowing fireball cutting through the sky. Scientists speculate that if it had landed on an ice sheet, it certainly vaporized both water and stone. Someone standing hundreds of miles from the impact site would have heard a deafening thunderclap and experienced hurricane force winds. But it actually makes sense. The approximate speed of meteors entering Earth's atmosphere is 45,000 miles per hour. For comparison, that is two and a half times the speed of a spaceship. It's bound to make some noise and leave a huge crater in the ground. Why is Australia so strangely empty? Why haven't we discovered so much of the ocean? Is our planet a perfect sphere? And was the Earth once more purple than green? I bet you didn't know these facts about our planet. So let's find it all out. Australia is really massive. To make it easy to understand its size, it's nearly as large as the entirety of Europe. Home to around 26 million people, Australia is among the countries with the least population per area. It's ranked only 55th for the highest population in the world, while it has the 6th largest land area. Why is so much of it empty? A good guess would be the many dangerous animals hiding behind every rock. At least this is enough for me to avoid Australia. But there's one specific reason to explain this. The dryness of Australia ensures that 85% of the population lives within 30 miles of the coast and 80% of them live along the eastern side where rainfall is more common. But although there is an overall lack of rainfall, only 20% of Australia is unlivable desert and only 40% is considered not habitable by human standards. The water consumption is actually higher than their average rainfall each year. But there is a further ancient water source hidden way below, which can support a much larger population. 
It's one of the largest underground freshwater resources in the world, the Great Artesian Basin. It covers a staggering 656,000 square miles, which is one-fifth the size of Australia. It holds enough water to cover the Earth under a 1.5 feet deep layer of water. Or, more usefully, it could provide enough water for thirsty Australians over the next 1,500 years. Only 6.5% of Australia has soil suitable for farming, so this doesn't seem like a huge amount. But in case you forgot, Australia is big. And this small percentage is about the size of France. With this massive area available for farming, Australia has more than enough to feed its population, with a further 70% of agriculture products that are exported overseas. So, with plenty of land, food and water, why are the population figures so low? A very slow migration process is the reason. First, only people from the United Kingdom lived there. Then, they opened their borders to other Europeans, and this restriction remained in place until 1973. You would think almost 200 years would be enough time for a lot of people to migrate, but Australia was just so far away. The risk of traveling such a long way and the cost of the journey meant that people from Europe prefer the shorter and cheaper options to migrate elsewhere, like Canada or the USA. For the past 2,000 years, people have understood that Earth is round. But did you know that it's not a perfect sphere? Through the wobbly rotation of Earth, our planet constantly changes its size, very slowly of course. The North and South Poles are surprisingly flat. Earth is pretty much like a ball being squished. Imagine there's a giant hand with the fingers pressing at both poles. Because of this pressure, the equator pushes a little outwards. Along with an uneven gravitational field, Earth has loads of gravity glitches some positive and others negative, creating an uneven, rocky and bumpy surface. Some places on Earth have more gravity than others. If you weighed yourself along the equator, you would weigh 0.5% less than at the poles. Not a whole lot and definitely not worth the trip to change your weight. If you were to measure the length from the center of the Earth towards the furthest point of Earth, you would be shocked that Mount Everest isn't at the end of it. Instead, it's along the equator, which is the pushed out part. Ecuador's mountain Chimborazo would actually be the tallest point on Earth as it's the furthest from the center. We still have around 80% of the ocean to map, which is crazy considering how much of the solar system we've explored in comparison. But we're still aware of many of the unbelievable details about the ocean. It covers over 80% of the world's surface, where 94% of the Earth's wildlife lives. And from some of the life in it, up to 80% of the world's oxygen is produced mainly from plankton, algae, and bacteria. One of the most famous already mapped places is the Mariana Trench. It's the deepest point on Earth, as low as almost 7 miles deep. That's a huge, 5 times the length of the Grand Canyon, and deeper than Mount Everest is tall. It's also home to one of the most ancient seabeds on Earth, casually laying low for about 180 million years. The pressure at the bottom is over 1,000 bars, but although this is 1,000 times more than normal pressure, life still flourishes here. Throughout the ocean, there is an estimated over 3 million shipwrecks lying in the murky depths. Countless artifacts sit there untouched, and there could be more than all the world's museums. The Mid-Ocean Ridge is the longest in the world, reaching 40,000 miles. That's almost 10 times the size of the Andes, the longest mountain range on land. The sun is the reason behind the blue and aqua colors of the ocean. This color isn't from the reflection of the sky, though they are both blue for the same reason. The surface of our planet receives white light from the sun, and it absorbs the orange, red, and yellow light stronger. It doesn't absorb the blue light so much, so it returns to how we see it. Of course, this only occurs based on how pure the water is. If the water is full of mud or algae, they scatter the light and overpower the water's natural blueness. There are many factors that determine what color we see on our planet. Could you believe that the Earth was green before? Instead, it was purple. Chlorophyll in our atmosphere absorbs mainly blue and red wavelengths from the sun, 
and reflects the green ones to what we see our planet as today. Long ago, ancient microbes called retinol dominated the Earth instead of chlorophyll. They absorbed green light and reflected red and violet light. Those microbes had a simpler structure, so they were easier to produce in the low oxygen environment of the early Earth. They provided our planet with a purplish color instead of green. But chlorophyll is more efficient, and as the Earth was developing, it eventually took over. Imagine that billions of years ago, faraway observers could see our home as a small purple dot. I wonder if we could have also been purple. Probably not. The biggest tree on Earth is a giant sequoia named General Sherman. It stands over 280 feet, almost reaching the height of a 26-story building. They believe it to be 2,700 years old, with a circumference of 1,000 inches. Its weight is a staggering 1,800 tons. That's heavy, but it isn't the heaviest living thing on Earth. In Utah, a huge grove of trees called Pando works like a single colony of trees. The massive root system connects all of them together with up to 47,000 stems. It weighs up to 6,000 tons and is 80,000 years old. It makes it the oldest living thing known to humans. Now, what about the biggest area of one being? Off the coast of Western Australia, a seaweed grows to an unthinkable size. The Poseidon's ribbon weed has been growing for 4,500 years, spreading underground clone shoots. It's all connected and shares the same DNA with most of its shoots. It covers a massive 77 square miles, the same size as 28,000 soccer fields, or the size of Nebraska. And it won't stop there either, as it continues to grow by two feet each year. It's hard to even picture the scale of these enormous beings. Now, just imagine if they were all purple. You're going to Ilha de Quiamada Grande, one of the most dangerous islands in the world. There, you find yourself among rainforests, huge rocks, and grasslands. The place is home to birds, locusts, and giant cockroaches. But there's one more animal, and because of it, the island got its notorious reputation. Snakes live there, and a lot of them. So many that the place is also known as Snake Island. Will you survive there? Located just 20 miles away from the coast of Brazil, the island has an area of 43 hectares, or over 100 acres. It probably got cut off from the mainland after the last ice age. The snakes were also separated from most other animal species. They didn't have competitors and had an unlimited source of food. In such a small area, there are up to 4,000 snakes. That's one snake for every 10 square feet. It would be a difficult feat not to come across a snake on this island. Not only is this snake, the golden lancehead, one of the most numerous on the island, but it's also a highly venomous pit viper species. And it's also one of the most venomous in all of Latin America. Its venom is so potent due to the isolation of the species, with only birds sharing the land with them. To catch these birds, the snake's venom needed to become extra strong. And indeed, since they got separated from their distant relatives, their venom has become up to five times more powerful. Most of the time, these snakes hide in the trees or amongst leaves on the ground. If you find yourself stranded here, you'll want to keep yourself a safe distance away. Snakes mainly use their sense of smell and rely on vibrations. If you get too close to one, either stand still or slowly walk away. If you make too many vibrations, this will make them feel threatened, causing them to strike. If you spot them a safe distance away, or if you're walking toward tall grass, stamp your feet a couple of times. This will notify snakes of your presence. They won't risk taking down prey larger than they are and will likely slither away. Carrying a stick is always a good idea, just in case you happen to come across a snake accidentally. This way, you'll have an extension of your arm that cannot be bitten. This simple thing might save your life. A stick with a V shape on the end will give you even more advantage. Even if a snake starts acting aggressively, holding it down will stop it in its tracks. But whatever happens, don't try to pick it up. Okay, but what if you get bitten? The chances are pretty high on this island, of course. First of all, don't try to get the venom out on your own. Make sure you call emergency services immediately. 
and once help is on the way, apply a wide bandage. A piece of clothing will do if you don't have anything else. Don't try to chase the snake trying to identify the species. Emergency services know how to figure out what venom it is. Now, just keep calm and wait for help. You might be wondering who you can call on this abandoned island. Well, since it's strictly prohibited to visit this place, there are signs advising to stay away all over the island, along with a number you can call if you run into trouble. Let's say you've successfully avoided getting bitten. The next thing to consider is what you can eat there. Snake Island was previously known as Ilha de Quemada Grande, where Quemada is Portuguese for forest being lit up or forest fire. The reason for that was the fact that the entire island was deliberately set on fire to make room for a banana plantation. Unfortunately, the banana business didn't turn out to be a success, probably because farmers got sick and tired of snakes. But some banana trees still thrive today, and they can provide you with some much needed nutrients. You'll also want some protein in your diet throughout your stay. Luckily, along with the snakes trapped on the island, there are also cockroaches. These giant prehistoric looking roaches come out at night to feed on plants. Get that barbecue started and enjoy the rare delicacy this island provides. A great way to survive on the island is to avoid it altogether. If by chance you happen to be sailing past, keep in mind that this place was once connected to the mainland. Rocks beneath the waves are very likely to damage the bottom of your boat if you get too close. Make sure you keep an appropriate distance when traveling past. Sure, this island is intriguing, but please remember that no matter how close you get to it, you won't be able to see snakes from the boat. You can only see these creatures if you get close enough, which you really shouldn't do. And it's not only reptiles that make this location dangerous. Pirates visit the island quite often. Not the sea shanty singing peg-legged arr pirates, but bio-pirates who come there to capture the very thing that makes it so dangerous. They come there for snakes, to catch them and sell them illegally. Since the island got cut off around 11,000 years ago, the golden lancehead has evolved within its own unique habitat. So, although there are many reptiles on this island, they're still an endangered species. Due to their limited numbers, their value is very high, reaching up to $30,000 on illegal markets, which gives biopirates the motivation to catch them. I can think of better ways to make a living. Anyway, let's say you've got all the resources necessary to survive in one of the most dangerous places on Earth. Do you think you would manage this feat? Perhaps you think it's impossible. You'd be surprised at how possible it can be, if you know what you're doing. It turns out many have visited this scary place before. Research teams often come there. They study the golden lancehead snake, its environment, and its food sources for conservation purposes. But scientists always make sure there's a doctor on the team. There's also a lighthouse on Snake Island. It had been operated by people until the 1920s. Then it became automated. One guess why. Brazilian authorities visit the lighthouse once a year to make sure it's still functional. Locals on the mainland know the reputation of the island, so the stories of people going missing are minimal. But one group of fishers once got too close to the island. As they were sailing along their normal route, they accidentally neared the shore. Their boat hit a rock under the waves and began filling with water. As the boat was quickly sinking, the men had only two options to try to survive in the rough sea or swim to the shores of Snake Island. It was a hard choice to make. After all, they had heard the stories, and it wasn't just about snakes. Rumor had it that the island was cursed. Regardless of the stories, the fishers chose to take their chances with Snake Island. After making it to the shore, they tried to be careful. Their knowledge of the island could help them survive. Most importantly, they knew to avoid the rainforest at all costs. As the men got hungry, they carefully walked along the edge of the forest, warily collecting bananas. They were mostly sitting, waiting, and conserving their energy. They could only drink water when it rained. It was just enough to sustain them. They slept on the beach, unprotected from the elements and weather. And all the time, they were so close to the comfort of the lighthouse or caves. They were probably overly cautious, but it was either enduring some discomfort or risking their lives for a dry bed. 
they didn't yield to the temptation. They managed to survive for three days without being bitten by a snake. After that, a passing boat finally rescued them. So, now you know, anything is possible. So, look at this map. This is not the Google Maps you open on your way to work. Here, you can see the world's most mysterious places. From the Bermuda Triangle to the Pyramids of Giza. From the islands of Dolls to Easter Island. So, grab your pith helmet and let's go! You're venturing deep into the Sahara. What's that on the horizon? It looks like the remains of a once thriving civilization. Near the city of Tiaret, 150 miles southwest of Algeria's capital, you can find 13 monuments shrouded in mystery. You see underground vaults and other constructions made of stone. They were built between the 4th and 7th centuries CE. Some chambers are interconnected with a labyrinth. Walking through it takes about two hours. People who once inhabited this place carve hunting scenes and animal figures on the walls. Researchers believe the place was built as a final resting place for the Berber royalty. But there's no way to prove it. And the abandoned city in the desert remains a mystery. Now, how about the Island of the Dolls? If this name doesn't give you the heebie-jeebies, I don't know what will. While moving down an ancient Aztec canal, you find this mysterious island. Hundreds of abandoned dolls are hanging from trees. There are so many, you lose count. Legends say it was a man who hung them there. He decided that one wasn't enough, so he spent his life hanging dolls on trees. Yeah, that's creepy. Speaking of creepy, in Mexican desert land, there's a spot called the Mapimi Silent Zone. People say no radio or any other kind of signal can be received there. I definitely wouldn't want to get lost there. In the far north of Canada lies inhospitable Lake Anjikuni. It's covered with snow and ice for half of the year. It was once home to the Inuit people. But something terrifying happened to this entire village. What exactly? This mystery is still unsolved. In 1930, Joe LaBelle was passing through a village that seemed deserted. He noticed that something was off there. There was no noise or any sign of human activity. He opened doors, one after another, but nobody was home. The inhabitants of the entire village were gone. They left behind seven sled dogs. Those were still tied to their posts. No one has been able to explain this disappearance so far. One of the world's biggest mysteries is the Pyramids of Giza. The Great Pyramid of Giza itself was built as a final resting place for Pharaoh Khufu around 4,500 years ago. It remains unexplained how the Egyptians managed to build the pyramids without any of the technology available to us nowadays. Interestingly, the pyramids align with Orion's belt and all face toward the north. Yellowstone National Park is known for its beauty but also for some bizarre accidents. For example, in the summer of 1929, hundreds of people visiting the site fell sick. It all began with six employees, but quickly spread to the staff and guests of different hotels. Until today, it's unknown what happened. People didn't eat the same food, nor did they drink from the same water source or stay at the same hotel. So make sure to keep an eye out for anything strange if you're ever in the area. The River Nid in North Yorkshire is said to turn things into stone. People from all over the world come to see this phenomenon with their own eyes. Tourists and locals travel there to leave different items in the well. A bicycle abandoned in the well turned into stone several days later. An old teddy bear became a piece of rock. Many believe that whoever stepped into this water would have a similar fate. But according to scientists, this is just a natural phenomenon. Local water is rich in minerals that form a coating around objects. It's this hard shell that makes them look as if they're made of stone. Now, how can rocks slide across the ground on their own? At Racetrack Playa, a dry lake bed at Death Valley National Park in California, they do. These moving rocks, called sailing stones, have been observed since the early 1900s. Locals believe that strong winds push them around. Other theories involve magnetic fields. 
In 2014, researchers discovered that the rocks were actually pushed by melting panels of floating ice driven by winds. Way to go, science! The Bermuda Triangle is a world-known, notorious place. That's where over 50 ships and 20 airplanes have allegedly disappeared. Rescue missions never came back. It's located off the coast of Florida, in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Unexplained disappearances there date back to the mid-19th century. There are different theories about why ships and planes vanish into thin air in this region. Some of them claim that the area is just extremely foggy, which makes it difficult for navigation. Another theory states that methane rising to the surface of the ocean can be the answer to this mystery. But no theory has been proven yet. In the mountainous country of Pakistan, you'll find the lost city of Mohenjo-Daro. This ancient archaeological site dates back to 2500 BCE. Scientists believe the city was built by the Indus Valley Civilization. Here, we see a well-planned street grid. And look at this elaborate drainage system. Nobody knows what happened to the people living in this town. The only thing scientists are almost sure about, it looks like something ended their lives all at once. Has the mystery of Easter Island finally been solved? You've probably heard of the fascinating monolithic statues standing on this Polynesian island. The statues, called Moai, weigh up to 90 tons. They were built by the Rapa Nui people. How they managed to transport the statues remains unexplained. Researchers from the University of California believe the statues were built to make the soil on the island more fertile. And the coolest thing? The analysis has shown that the areas where the Moai sculptures stand are indeed more fertile. The crooked forest in Poland is weird, to say the least. A grove of oddly shaped pine trees looks like something straight out of a sci-fi movie. The grove is home to around 400 pines that were planted in 1930. They all first bend toward the north and then continue growing upright. No one knows for sure why this happened. The surrounding forest is full of perfectly straight pine trees. Is there a monstrous creature living at the bottom of Loch Ness in Scotland? Whether it's a myth or reality, it sure is spooky. The legend of the Loch Ness Monster appeared somewhere around 1933. Since then, people have been claiming to have seen dragons, prehistoric monsters, and sea serpents in the lake. Will we ever know the truth? The Wharton Basin, off the western coast of Australia, is home to odd geological phenomena. Huge earthquakes happen there, one after another. This would be unsurprising if the area was located above a fault line, which is where two tectonic plates meet. But that isn't the case. The area is located on the Australian plate, but researchers believe that a new fault line might be forming there. This is the only reasonable explanation for what's happening in that area. One of the most isolated places on Earth, the North Pole, is as mysterious as it gets. A land of ice and odd disappearances. In the late 1840s, an expedition of more than 130 people, known as the Franklin Expedition, vanished in that region. Some evidence was found 150 years later. A leather shoe and snippets of journal entries. My own theory? They were all hired by Santa Claus to work in his toy factory. Yeah, no one else bought it either. Machu Picchu is also known as the Lost City of the Incas. It's a testament to the power of the Inca civilization. But the purpose of the site is still a mystery to be unraveled. The citadel was constructed at 7,000 feet above sea level around 1450 CE. The question remains, why did the Incas build a city like this in a place so inaccessible? Archaeologists have discovered that most of the city is built underground, and about 60% of the place remains unexplored. So who knows what might be hiding down there? The Mariana Trench is the world's deepest, darkest place. Imagine this. No sunlight, freezing waters. There seems to be little to no chance of life existing so deep under the surface. Yet sea explorers claim to hear a bizarre sound coming from the depths of the trench. The records of this mysterious noise lead some to believe that a deep sea monster is calling the trench its home. All right, too spooky. I'm out of here. 
When Gustave Eiffel was designing his famous tower in Paris, he added a secret apartment for himself right on top of it. Visitors to the third level can now take a glimpse of the apartment through a small window. It has wax figures of Eiffel himself, his daughter Claire, and Thomas Edison, who is one of the lucky fellows who got to see it in Eiffel's time. There are also secret apartments on the other side of the Atlantic, in the New York Public Libraries. They're meant for the library superintendents and their families. They used to live, cook meals, take showers, and do other regular things in the Schwartzman Building on 5th Avenue. They also had a cool bonus of walking the library rooms at night. Daughter of the first superintendent, John Fiedler, was even born in there. A whole maze of tunnels called the Hypogeum is hidden under Rome's Colosseum. Back in the day, when it was an arena, the chambers in the tunnels were used to house gladiators, the equipment for special effects, and giant cages with animals – elephants, leopards, panthers, and bears. Oh my! Starting from 2010, tourists have been allowed to get a tour of the maze. Disney's Magic Kingdom in Florida has its own maze of color-coded tunnels for way less sinister purposes. It's a whole city used by cast members to keep the magic alive. This is where they dress up, have lunch, rehearse, and move from one land to another without kids spotting them. To make it all possible, construction workers had to dig 8 million tons of earth to put the entire park on an elevation and build the tunnels on ground level. If you're ever lucky enough to visit the basement of the White House under the North Portico, you'll find some unexpected places. The carpenter's shop is where the equipment and furniture of the White House gets renovated. The flower shop makes and takes care of flower arrangements for different rooms in the house and centerpieces for events. There is also a dental surgery and a one-lane bowling alley. Behind the mist and water of Niagara Falls, it's a limestone cave of the evil spirits. It has a sinister history involving famous French explorer La Salle. According to the legend, a voice told him to leave the area in the Iroquois language. When he didn't listen, his life turned into one huge misfortune. The cave is still producing scary groaning sounds today. Next time you're waiting for your departure at Grand Central Terminal, Remember, you can play some tennis at the Vanderbilt Luxury Tennis Club. It's in the annex on the fourth floor, which used to be an art gallery, a TV studio for CBS, and even an indoor ski slope covered with artificial grass. Now there are two tennis courts, two practice lanes, and a fitness room in there. A basketball court, nicknamed the highest court in the land, is located just above the courtroom on the fifth floor of the United States Supreme Court building in Washington, D.C. It was used as a room for journalists up until the 1940s when it was turned into a workout room. It's not open to the general public, but clerks, off-duty police officers, and other Supreme Court employees like to play here between court sessions. There is a hall of records hidden behind President Abraham Lincoln's face at Mount Rushmore. The monument sculptor Gutzon Borglum wanted to put it there to make it forever significant. Years after he passed away, the room got porcelain enamel panels with the words to the U.S. Constitution, the Bill of Rights, and the Declaration of Independence, and explanations why these very presidents were chosen for the monument. If you ever make it to Florence, Italy, go check out an unmarked door on the first floor of the Uffizi Gallery. It opens into the Vasari Corridor built in the 16th century and connecting the gallery to Pitti Palace. To build it, architect Vasari had to go through several medieval towers and even people's homes. One family objected, so the corridor had to go around their tower. You can now see 16th and 17th centuries art inside the corridor. New York City's iconic Waldorf Astoria Hotel stands atop the mysterious abandoned Track 61. There is a locked door on 49th Street and a private elevator leading there. VIPs like presidents and celebrities used it to enter the hotel unnoticed by the public. There's still a train car at the station. There are no official tours going there, but now that you know of it, you can spot the station out of the window 
on some Metro North trains to your right. The Sydney Opera House was opened by Queen Elizabeth II herself in 1973. It has venues for opera, ballet, classical, and modern music and dance, and an added bonus of a nightclub called The Studio, fitting 300 people. It plays underground music and hosts contemporary music festivals featuring famous rappers. The smallest police station in Great Britain used to be located in a lamppost right in Trafalgar Square. It was put there in 1926 to accommodate one police officer who'd secretly watch over strike activists. They say it even had a phone line to call Scotland Yard. The place is now used as a cleaning closet. One of the most famous sites of New York has an extra floor not so many people know about. Mostly celebrities and engineers have access to floor 103 of the Empire State Building. They get there through a hidden stairway, and the view is perfectly unobstructed as there is just a knee-high ledge with a railing. The Amazon rainforest in Brazil is a secret home to more tribes completely disconnected from the rest of the world than any other place. There are over 100 of those groups that have a dramatic history of encounters with outsiders. Whenever a stranger approaches, they use arrows, clubs, and other things to protect themselves or simply hide behind the trees. A few years ago, scientists found a mysterious void above the Grand Gallery of Egypt's Great Pyramid of Giza. They still don't know exactly how large the void is because they can't go in or use usual research methods not to destroy a tiny bit of the pyramid. Only super-sensitive detectors are used on it from the outside. The researchers are guessing it could have served as another gallery or a construction ramp. A giant statue of Leonardo da Vinci has been welcoming visitors to Rome at Fiumicino Airport since 1960. 46 years after its opening, the statue was going through renovation. One of the workers found a little hatch in the middle of it. There were two parchments inside, still perfectly preserved. Take your binoculars with you, and maybe you can spot them from the plane the next time you're there. Roxy Suite is located in one of New York's prime locations, on the fifth floor above the stage of Radio City Music Hall. It was named after a vaudeville producer who wanted to have his own apartment in the theater itself back in 1932. You can take a good look at it during the stage door tour, or rent it as long as you have some good spare money. St. Mark's Basilica in Venice is so majestic on the outside, you'd hardly want to look underground. If you do, though, you'll find a well-preserved mysterious 11th century crypt. A lot's happened to it in all this time. It used to be sealed because of floods. There's still water inside it now, which looks like a mirror pool. It's pretty tricky, but not impossible to get a tour of it. Abraham Lincoln Memorial is sitting on a marble throne on top of a three-story basement. Engineers building the monument set concrete columns in there to support the construction. By the time it was discovered in 1975 during renovation, the basement had turned into a legit cave with stalactites and an ecosystem. They also found some graffiti from 1914 down there. The room will likely be turned into retail space, and visitors will be able to see all the underground findings safely. If you ask Google to give you directions to Little Compton Street, it shows just one spot that looks like a mistake. In reality, the street is completely hidden under Charing Cross Road. The street level used to be way lower where the basements are today. It was raised in the late 19th century, and an office block was set on top of Little Compton Street. You can still see two road signs showing where it was. North Yungus Road in Bolivia is one of the most picturesque and most hazardous roads in the world. Just imagine biking along a cliff trail at a mind-numbing height, overlooking the lush Bolivian jungle and misty mountains at a distance. What a view! But as soon as you realize you're riding on a 10-foot-wide stretch of road, some of which isn't even paved, 
you might get skin crawls. And for a good reason. Over 200 folks tumble to their demise each year on this devious mountain climb. And the absence of any guardrail doesn't help at all. Now, if you're more into walking, consider the Husseini Bridge in Pakistan. It's officially the most dangerous hanging bridge in the world, but hardly the only one in the country. It's a long and nerve-wracking traverse over Lake Borat, with many planks of the bridge missing and the whole construction creaking ominously in the wind. Still, the place has become a major tourist attraction, although the old and broken bridge visible nearby only adds to the impression that you're inevitably going to fall to a screaming end. Well, at least you can be thankful that the lake beneath is not Lake Natron in Tanzania. If you fall into water, you still have a chance of survival. If you fall into the waters of Natron, not so much. The pH levels here are a skin-melting 10.5. What passes for water is more like an alkaline soup. No wonder this place is so peaceful. Pretty much nothing wants to live here. And yet, flocks of flamingos come to Lake Natron to breed every few seasons, and it becomes a white-pink paradise for the period. Positively. Which can't be said about the Danakil Depression in Ethiopia. Despite its beautiful, otherworldly landscape, it's perhaps the loneliest place on Earth. Yellow, orange, and green mounds are made of salt, sulfur, and iron, creating views like nowhere else on the planet. Yet the combination of temperature and toxic minerals makes this place absolutely unlivable. Researchers coming here haven't found even microscopic life in this valley. Really, like another planet. Beautiful and desolate. On the other hand, there's an island that's bubbling with life, yet still you don't want to be there. It's called Snake Island, and the name says it all. It's chock full of snakes. In fact, there are so many of them, especially the venomous varieties, that Brazil has forbidden access to the island to any and all visitors. But even if it wasn't closed off, not many would be brave enough to go to a place where a single step offshore could land you a venomous bite. Now, I'll bet that fly geyser in the middle of the Nevada desert was created partly because humans became jealous of that. This place had been just another bit of desert until 1916. People came here to drill a water well. They quickly saw the error of their ways, though. The water came out boiling hot and unfit for drinking. 50 years later, there was another attempt, but the same thing happened. We don't learn, do we? Anyway, hot water never stops spewing from under the ground. And today, we have a massive geyser cluster colored in shades of red, orange, and yellow. Now, I say let's take a break from things that could bite, burn, or crush you and take a walk in a serene forest. We're in Japan, and it's Sagano Bamboo Forest, a marvelous natural park where you can't help but hush your voice and just look. And listen, too. Because the sound of the wind in the bamboo trees is the first ever officially recognized soundscape. All the more surprising to find such a place just half an hour's ride from Kyoto one of the busiest cities in the country. Take a deep breath of fresh air now. You're gonna need it. We're going underwater. Behold the Great Blue Hole, apparently named by Captain Obvious. It's one of the most beautiful places on the planet. Located off the coast of Belize, this giant sinkhole is a massive tourist attraction, especially popular among divers. It's actually a whole cave system, and they say it gets weirder and more picturesque the deeper you dive. Beware, though, it's popular among sharks, too. And both bull sharks and hammerheads have been spotted here more than once. Here, have a towel and prepare for some barbecue. The Darvasa gas crater is waiting. A huge hole again, this time in the ground and burning. Over 50 years ago, geologists found this spot in Turkmenia, Central Asia, and were quite a bit alarmed there was an enormous deposit of methane, a highly flammable gas, underground. They set it on fire to prevent the gas from spreading, and since then, the holes kept burning. It's over 200 feet across and 100 feet deep, and no one knows when it'll finally run out of fuel. Is it too hot again? Well, let's have a little swim with jellyfish then. 
Jellyfish Lake on one of the rock islands in Palau is perfectly described by its name. In 2005, there were about 30 million of these creatures here. Although today only 700,000 of them remain, their number is growing and tourists can actually swim with them. Until they get stung, that is. Okay, kidding, these jellyfish don't have stingers, so it's safe. Until they decide to grow stingers, of course. From the depths, we're going even deeper. The Gomantong Caves are our next stop. The cave system on the island of Borneo could have been Batman's hideout, given how many bats live there. At night, these nocturnal animals fly out of the cave in the thousands, making you wonder why you're still there watching it. But if you're brave enough to go inside the cave, you can truly marvel at the variety given to us by nature. Because there, on the floor and walls of the cave, lie tons of bat droppings, giving food and home to millions of cockroaches, parasites, and giant centipedes. Wondrous. Okay, I'm out of here. Now, if you're as easy to get away as I am, here's a place to go. Medidi National Park in Bolivia. It's one of the largest protected areas in South America and is home to an immense variety of animals, birds, and insects. I could do without the mosquitoes, but it's still among the few places where you could see wild macaws, monkeys, capybaras, and dozens of other creatures. Still, it's better to be careful because wild animals aren't always happy to see you, and there are known cases of attacks on tourists. Ever wanted to feel like Frodo Baggins in Middle Earth? Here's your chance! In Iceland, there's a slumbering volcano named Thrigúka Gegurth that welcomes guests to a tea party. Now, don't confuse this with another infamous Icelandic volcano, Eyjafjallajökull. Yukuk. Yeah, it's easy to mix them up, they sound so similar. Here, tourists are actually ushered down into the volcano and spend close to an hour inside, looking at the magmatic landscape. They say Thrinuka Gegur can't wake up all of a sudden, but who knows? Don't forget to bring the Ring of Power just in case. From the lowest dungeon to the highest peak, and here we are at Mount Hua in China. It's called the most dangerous hike in the world for a reason. It's high, it's crazy scary, and it's a hike. At the height of 7,000 feet, which already makes me reconsider, there are several wooden planks nailed to the sheer wall of the mountain. When you get to the start of the hike, you put on safety gear and realize there's no turning back. You have to walk all the way. And then back! But if you're lucky, you'll see a crowd of hundreds of tourists and decide not to spend hours waiting for your turn. Finally, to really creep you out, I'm taking you to Pripyat in Ukraine. If you watch the TV show Chernobyl, you probably know what happened in this area. If you didn't see it, well, don't have a meltdown. Much of the town is still off-limits for visitors, but there are already guided tours around the place. As haunting as it is, the landscape has some magnetic force. The silence makes you keep as quiet as you can. Also, you can see with your own eyes what happens when people abandon a whole city. Nature takes back what once belonged to it. Creeping vines along the walls and lampposts, trees and bushes sprouting from under concrete. And the main attraction in this desolate place is the rusty old Ferris wheel. That sure shivers my timbers.